uh, got me thinking about that. And when I went to uh, find out what had actually uh, taken place of anything uh, in the in the uh, second half of the war uh, uh, in 1863, I discovered that in fact a great deal uh, had happened uh, during this uh, time period. Uh, and so I started to read about it, research it. There weren't any books. Uh, on the library shelves that talked about this period, an occasional reference in a regimental history here and, uh, and a biography there. Um, and so it meant going into the official records and the newspapers and, and all of this. And I discovered that, in fact, there was a great deal that happened in the second half of 1863. Neither Meade's army nor Lee's army was quiet. There was a great deal of campaigning, a lot of marching, uh, a substantial amount of fighting. Uh, there was always the possibility that this would escalate into a major confrontation on the scale of a Chancellorsville or Fredericksburg or an Antietam or something like that. Uh, they didn't, of course, get to that point, uh, but it was always a possibility. And what happens in the second half of 1863 really sets the stage for what's going to happen uh, in the spring campaign of 1864. You, you can't get from Gettysburg to the wilderness without looking at what Meade and Lee are doing in this period after Gettysburg and before uh, the arrival of uh, Grant. Uh, of course, uh, the story really begins at a point that uh, uh, most people believe constitutes the end of uh, the Gettysburg campaign, the great battle in Pennsylvania, July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, uh, which saw Lee's army retreating uh, back toward uh, the Potomac River. Uh, and that retreat is very well covered. Uh, and a lot of great books written by really great historians uh, that take you to the point uh, where Lee finds himself backed up uh, against a flooded Potomac River. Uh, the bridge he'd left behind at, uh, near Williamsport had been destroyed by Union cavalry on uh, July 3rd, an all-around bad day uh, for the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, river's not fordable, and so Lee gets there. The Federal Army is in fairly close pursuit. Uh, and the Confederates have to turn and face uh, their pursuers uh, and uh, and uh, be ready to fight a battle while these engineers are uh, cobbling together uh, a bridge. Uh, the Confederates are using ferries to send wounded back across the Potomac and bring fresh stocks of ammunition over uh, onto the Maryland shore. But for a lot of uh, people uh, in uh, the North, and especially in the administration of Washington, D.C., uh, this looked like an opportunity to finish off the Army of Northern Virginia uh, once and for all. There was certainly a lot of pressure on me to do that. Uh, there was an expectation among his troops that they would be thrown at the Confederates, that there would be one final decisive battle. Uh, and if Lee's army could be destroyed on the north bank of the Potomac uh, and taken together with Grant uh, and Banks' recent victories, uh, along the Mississippi River, that would go a very long way uh, toward ending the war. Uh, closer uh, to a events, however, um, it, it was not so easy as that. The Army of the Potomac had been as badly hurt at Gettysburg as uh, the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, the march uh, toward the Potomac had been as miserable uh, for the Federals who were basically short of everything. Uh, during the pursuit, uh, Union troops uh, were marching without shoes, uh, some of them actually walking in their underwear uh, because their pants had worn out, a condition that we uh, more commonly associate with the Confederates. Uh, so uh, both armies were, were wounded animals by the time that uh, Meade gets to uh, Williamsport and finds the Confederates dug in uh, with their flanks anchored on the Potomac. Uh, as Meade comes up, he plans a reconnaissance in force. Uh, to see if he can find a weak point in the Confederate line. Uh, he decides to delay uh, at the advice of many of his officers, wait for some reinforcements to come up. Uh, Meade does not believe that uh, Lee's going to be capable of escaping across uh, the Potomac River. But when he sends word to Washington that he's going to take an extra day, uh, this leads to uh, a very sharp rebuke uh, from uh, Union General-in-Chief Henry W. Halleck, uh, who tells Lee to, or tells me to attack Lee uh, immediately, hold no councils of war, uh, strike the enemy uh, before he can escape. And so Meade launches his reconnaissance in force on the morning of October, uh, I'm sorry, of uh, July 14th, 1863. But when the Union soldiers go forward, uh, they find that the Confederates have left. Their stout fortifications are empty. Uh, they're going to pick up some stragglers. Uh, but Lee has managed to get across the Potomac 
uh, on the makeshift bridge that his engineers uh, had finally completed. And the Potomac has, has fallen to a point where it's it's barely affordable. And so on the morning of October 14th, 18, I'm sorry, July 14th, 1863, uh, the, the Confederate Army uh, is back in Virginia. Uh, and this is a huge disappointment for everybody in the North, uh, everybody wearing uh, blue. Uh, and it was a major disappointment for President Abraham Lincoln, uh, who believed, rightly or wrongly, uh, that Meade had let this golden opportunity to all but finish the war uh, slip through his uh, fingers. Uh, from the perspective of a lot of Meade's officers, uh, Meade himself, when they got a look at the fortifications that the Confederates had constructed while in Williamsport, uh, they uh, they believed that to have attacked them uh, would have been to met a very uh, bloody repulse. Uh, and uh, therefore, most federal officers thought that Meade had acted wisely. Uh, the opinions of his troops were somewhat uh, mixed. Uh, certainly, uh, some of them thought that a, an attack would have been a mistake. Others thought that there was a chance here to finish the war uh, and wish they had been thrown into it. But all of that is now moot. The Confederates uh, are gone. Um, it's not quite over, of course, because Halleck sends a telegram uh, to Meade expressing Lincoln's dissatisfaction uh, at Lee's escape. Uh, Meade, who remembered only taking command of the army on June 28, just three days before the battle at Gettysburg, uh, has been under enormous strain, uh, and uh, and he has a very uh, uh, hair trigger temper, uh, and he sees that word dissatisfaction as censure. This is the president uh, telling them he has not done what he should have done, not done what somebody else would have done, uh, and Meade thinks that this is grossly unfair. Uh, and so he demands that he be replaced as commander of the Army of the Potomac, uh, a job he reminds Halleck that he had not asked for, but he had been ordered to. Um, of course, firing the general who's just won this great battle, uh, really the first Union general who can claim to unquestionably have beaten Robert E. Lee on, on the battlefield, uh, is, is not in the cards. Uh, and uh, Halleck sends back a message changing the word dissatisfaction to disappointment, uh, and ordering Meade uh, to pursue Lee. And so Meade gets a direct order from Halleck here. The enemy should be pursued and cut up wherever he may have gone. Uh, and so Meade has no questions uh, about what he is expected to do. Uh, so uh, he stays in command, and this little set to with uh, Halleck and President Lincoln is usually the point where most histories of the Gettysburg campaign come to an end, because it's a very nice ending point after you've spent many hundreds of pages talking about a very complex and dramatic campaign, one of the greatest battles uh, to be fought uh, in, the, in the entire war. And so we'll, we'll bring down the curtain here, the Gettysburg campaign is over. The problem with that is that the Gettysburg campaign was not over, uh, nor was the war. Uh, the sun was going to come up on July 14th, uh, of 1863. The Army of the Potomac was still there. The Army of Northern Virginia was still there. Uh, the generals and the troops uh, still have duties to perform. Uh, and in, in nobody's estimation, uh, on either side of the Potomac, is this campaign concluded? Uh, Meade is expected to cross the river uh, and continue the pursuit of Lee and try and force him into a finished battle. And Lee, of course, is going to ha have to be responsive uh, to that uh, threat. Uh, so what does Meade do? He begins to slide his troops off to the east uh, toward Harpers Ferry and Berlin, Maryland, uh, where he intends to cross the river. Uh, even as he is doing that, Union forces are already entering uh, the Shenandoah Valley. It's not that Meade had not been trying to get troops over the river, even as there had been this major concentration and confrontation on the north bank of the Potomac around Williamsport uh, and Falling Waters. So on uh, July 14th, uh, about 3,500 troops under Brigadier General Negley uh, came down off Maryland Heights uh, and uh, used a pontoon bridge built by the 50th New York Engineers uh, to cross into Harper's Ferry. Uh, they chased away a small uh, Confederate picket post. Uh, and so the first Union soldiers to enter Virginia uh, after the Battle of Gettysburg, do so on the very morning that Lee has gotten his army 
uh, back into uh, Virginia. At the same time, Major General Alfred Pleasanton, who's the commander of the Army of the Potomac's Cavalry Corps, uh, has uh, ordered uh, Brigadier General David Gregg, who commands his 2nd Cavalry Division, uh, to go to Harper's Ferry with two of his brigades, cross the river, and attempt to cut Lee's supply line uh, south of the Potomac. Of course, these orders were issued uh, before anybody in the Army of the Potomac knew uh, that the Confederates had retreated back into Virginia. So Gregg believes that he's going to get below the river while Lee is still north of it and try and cut him off uh, from a source of a resupply. And so uh, the Federal Army is beginning to move uh, even as Lee's army comes to a stop uh, not very far from the Potomac around the towns of Darksville and Bunker Hill. And here Lee is going to pause uh, to rest his troops uh, who are, of course, in badly, uh, very badly in need of rest, uh, but also to pause because he's got a lot of booty and a lot of wounded and a lot of prisoners that he needs to shove uh, southward uh, through the Shenandoah Valley. He's got almost 20,000 head of cattle, uh, as many uh, uh, sheep uh, with him. He's got 4,000 Union prisoners. He's got something like 8,000 wounded. Uh, and all of this has to go down the Valley Pike. That's a very slow moving procession. Uh, and so Lee's going to pause uh, in the northern reaches of the valley uh, to rest his troops, to give all of this uh, slow moving traffic a chance to gain some ground uh, in front of him uh, and also to see what Meade is going to do. Uh, you're almost in exactly the same spot that the armies had been in after the Battle of Sharpsburg the year before. Uh, at that point, George McClellan had not entered Virginia until October. Uh, so he'd waited almost six weeks before following up his victory uh, along Antietam Creek. Might need do the same thing. If Lee can do it, he would like to keep the Army of the Potomac close uh, to its namesake, a river, and he is going to take advantage of the necessity of a pause uh, to see if uh, Meade is going to be aggressive or if Meade is going to be as timid uh, as uh, General McClellan had been. Of course, Meade knows that that's not in the cards. Uh, and so what Meade is going to do is he's going to, as I said, take his army here off to the east, and he plans to cross it uh, over the Potomac River at Berlin and Harpers Ferry and to enter the Loudoun Valley. Now, Loudoun Valley uh, is uh, between the uh, Blue Ridge here and the Bull Run Mountains here. It's parallel to the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, the Shenandoah Valley, of course, has the Shenandoah River, which runs along the west bank of the, uh, of the Blue Ridge here. Uh, and by taking his army into the Loudoun Valley, uh, Meade is, is doing something that's very astute from a strategic perspective. He says it's pointless to chase Lee into the Shenandoah Valley, to trace him directly, because, of course, Lee has freedom of maneuver. He can retreat south. I'm never going to catch up to him and force him to fight. So if I want to try... Uh, and bring Lee uh, to battle. I'm going to put myself on his strategic flank. I'm going to use the mountains to protect my crossing of the river, and then I'm going to move south, and if I can, I'm going to take control of the passes in the Blue Ridge that Lee would have to use to get back into central Virginia, uh, or somewhere around Culpeper Courthouse, probably uh, the point from which he basically had started of the Gettysburg campaign. And if Meade can move fa south fast enough and he can get through one of these gaps, there's an opportunity to shove the Army of the Potomac into the Shenandoah Valley uh, and uh, get it south of Lee and trap him uh, against the south bank of the Potomac River in the way that he had been trapped against the north bank of the Potomac River before the night of July 13 and 14. And so what you see here uh, is the big overarching uh, view of the campaign that is about to follow this final forgotten stage of the Gettysburg campaign that's going to consume uh, the next 10 uh, to 12 days. And so Meade is trying to bring his forces into the Loudoun Valley. It's going to take some days to get that done. But while he's moving in that direction, other federal forces are crossing the Potomac on the western side of the Shenandoah Valley. And these forces are under the command of Brigadier General Benjamin Kelly, who had been in charge of troops garrisoning uh, uh, the new state of West Virginia, uh, protecting the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Uh, Kelly had been told when Lee began to invade 
Pennsylvania to gather his troops together and move east uh, to support the Army of the Potomac. Uh, this is going to take some time because his troops are very widely scattered, uh, but he manages to get them together, about 6,000 men, a mix of infantry, cavalry, mounted infantry, artillery, uh, and he moves them to the area of Williamsport, but he doesn't get there until July 15th of 63. And by the time he gets there, everybody's gone. The Confederates are south of the river. Meade is marching uh, to the east toward Berlin and Harper's Ferry. Uh, and the, the great big battle uh, that General Kelly thought he was marching to join uh, apparently is not going to happen uh, here. And so he telegraphs Halleck uh, asking for orders. Uh, and Halleck tells him to cross the Potomac River uh, near where he's at and, and, quote, seek to do some harm uh, to the enemy. Uh, that is uh, a, a very tricky uh, proposition uh, in terms of uh, General Kelly's thinking. He's got 6,000 men. Uh, he doesn't know exactly how big the Army of Northern Virginia is. It's, it's in fact down to about 45,000 troops, uh, but 45,000 is a whole bunch more than 6,000. Uh, and Kelly is worried that if he crosses the river, uh, he's isolated, he's vulnerable, he, he better be very careful uh, but orders are orders. And so he begins to cross the river uh, around Cherry Run Ford, which is right here on the uh, upper edge of this map at a place called uh, uh, near where Cherry Creek runs into the Potomac. Uh, this is a picture of Cherry Run Ford uh, in the 1880s. Uh, the Potomac River, of course, is swollen at this point to a, a width of, of 1,500 feet. Uh, so almost everything you see in this picture would have been underwater. Uh, on July 15th of 1863. Uh, the current is moving very fast and Kelly only has three small skiffs uh, to try and get his 6,000 men, their wagons, their horses, their artillery over the river. Uh, it's going to be a back-breaking back uh, effort. It's gonna take him three days uh, to get his troops uh, into the Shenandoah Valley. The current is so bad that on every trip, the boats are swept a half a mile downstream. Uh, and then they have to be brought to the other side and brought back upstream uh, against the current in order for the uh, crossing uh, to continue. Uh, but Kelly is nothing if he's not determined. He manages to get that done. And by uh, the evening of July 17th, uh, he's up here in the northwestern reach of the Shenandoah Valley and uh, beginning to move uh, toward Hedgesville, uh, which is going to become his base. Uh, on the other side of the Shenandoah, what's happening? Well, General Gregg uh, has crossed into Harper's Ferry on the uh, late afternoon of July 14th. Uh, there's been a skirmish, a small skirmish with Confederate cavalry. Uh, the next morning, uh, Gregg takes two of his brigades. His third brigade is still coming uh, toward him. Uh, it's not with him at this point. It's been ordered to reinforce him, but it'll be another day before it arrives uh, in the valley. Uh, Greg marches toward Charlestown, uh, seeking to find a way to cut Lee's supply line. Uh, as he gets close to Charlestown, he runs into the Confederate Cavalry Brigade of Grumble Jones and some of Stewart's horse artillery, uh, and they put up a pretty stout resistance. So Greg says, well, that's not the way I'm going to cut Lee's supply line. So he leaves a few troops to keep watch on these rebels, and he takes the rest of his force uh, north uh, uh, to the little village of Shepherdstown, which is not very far away uh, from Sharpsburg, Maryland. So this is to the northwest of Harpers Ferry, right on the banks of the Potomac River. Uh, Greg sweeps into the town on the late afternoon of July 15, 63, captures a handful of Confederates and some supplies, uh, and then spreads his troops out in an arc around the town, still looking for a way to cut Lee's supply line. Uh, very quickly, however, he picks up rumors that the Army of Northern Virginia uh, is very close by. Uh, it's maybe, uh, you know, 20 miles away at best, perhaps closer. And it's not just rebel cavalry. It is the Confederate main body of infantry, which, of course, is nothing that General Gregg wants to uh, tangle with. So he's sitting there in Shepherdstown trying to figure out what to do. Uh, and, of course, he's not the only one aware of the tactical situation. Jeb Stewart has learned that a Yankee cavalry division uh, is in Shepherdstown and he has plotted its destruction. Uh, so on July 16th, 1863, Stewart brings three of his brigades 
uh, to, uh, to Shepherdstown uh, to deal with uh, David Gregg. And this is going to bring about a very tough cavalry fight on July 16th, the Battle of Shepherdstown. Uh, it's not one of these uh, great uh, cavalry battles in the sense of sweeping charges because this area is not only very rugged, uh, it's also thoroughly uh, overrun with stout rail and stone fences. And so almost all of the combat uh, is done on foot. Uh, the Confederates initially drive the most forward Union units backwards, but then Gregg's uh, men take position on a wooded ridge behind a stone wall. Uh, the Confederates, uh, who are led by Fitz Lee during most of this battle because Stuart's been called back to Army headquarters, uh, bring up their horse artillery. Uh, they pound the Union position, but it really doesn't do any good. Uh, lots of Confederate attacks are pushed back uh, very late in the day. Uh, final Confederate Brigade reaches the field and it allows the rebels to exploit a failed Union counterattack. And they cave in the Yankee right flank and drive it back about a quarter of a mile before the Union position stabilizes. So the uh, battle comes to an end uh, at darkness. Uh, and Greg is almost out of ammunition. He is out of rations. Uh, and he has been waiting for his third brigade under Colonel Pinnock Huey, uh, to uh, arrive and reinforce them. Uh, Huey had no idea uh, that Lee had crossed the Potomac or that there was any urgency, so he sort of took his time, uh, got into Harper's Ferry around noon on the 16th and was resting his troops uh, when an urgent courier uh, arrived uh, with word from Greg that he was in a battle and he needed that third brigade. Uh, and so Huey started to the Northwest, moving from Harper's Ferry uh, towards Shepherdstown but along the way, uh, he runs into a company of Confederate cavalry, Company D uh, of the 12th Virginia. And it had been picketing the area uh, between Shepherdstown and Harpers Ferry when Greg had swept north the day before. And as a consequence, this company had gotten cut off behind Union lines. Unfortunately for the rebels, uh, this unit had been raised uh, in this part of Virginia, it knew the terrain very well. And so instead of trying to get it back to its own line or panicking or something like that, it has spent the day uh, laywaying uh, incautious Federals moving around in small groups, capturing wagons, that sort of stuff. And one of the wagons that had been captured uh, was Greg's headquarters wagon. Uh, and so this uh, intrigues the Confederate officer in charge. Uh, he says, well, there's a, a Yankee Brigade headquarters wagon here. There are a lot of Yankees somewhere. Let's go looking for them. And as a consequence of that, one of his patrols uh, crosses path with Huey as he's moving toward Shepherdstown. Uh, and uh, Huey, having picked up word that the Confederates are very active in this uh, area, uh, is surprised to have run into rebels. And he halts his brigade, and throws it into line of battle, and deploys his artillery and prepares to receive an attack which of course isn't going to happen. There are a lot of Confederates around him, maybe a hundred, they're grossly outnumbered. They're not going to, to make a foolish attack, uh, but this freezes Huey in place uh, for the rest of the day. And so it's after dark before he reaches Greg's battered line near Shepherdstown. And what Huey tells Greg is that there are a whole bunch of Confederates between the Second Cavalry Division and Harper's Ferry. In, in fact, we're surrounded, uh, and uh, we've got Confederates to the west of us, we've got Confederates to the south of us, we've got Confederates to the east of us, and a flooded Potomac River uh, to the north of us. We're trapped. Uh, and the Confederates certainly considered uh, Greg trapped. They were laying careful plans to finish him off the next morning. Uh, but one of Greg's scouts tells him that there's a narrow trail uh, that traces the route of the Potomac back to Harper's Ferry. It's barely wide enough for a column of twos, and in some places only wide enough for a column of ones, uh, but it is there, and Greg decides that that is the only avenue of retreat that he has available to him. And so after midnight, he begins to pull his troops clandestinely off the line. Uh, they sneak away without the Confederates realizing that they're going, it's going to take them all night to get back to Harper's Ferry, but the Confederates are not going to realize that the Federals have escaped until the next morning, uh, and their pursuit will be too late uh, and ineffective. But nonetheless, the Battle of Shepherdstown, uh, which one Federal cavalryman called one of the hardest fights that the cavalry had been in uh, during the war up to this point, uh, has been 
uh, a success strategically for the rebels. If they had not destroyed Greg's division, as they had hoped they would, they have shoved it back into Harper's Ferry, uh, where it is not going to be a threat uh, to Robert E. Lee. Uh, so uh, as this is happening, Meade is closing in on Berlin. Uh, he's got a pontoon bridge down at Harper's Ferry. His engineers are going to start to lay a bridge uh, at Berlin. Uh, it, that's not as easy as it might sound, uh, because with the river having swollen, uh, the bridge train does not have enough pontoons and equipment to bridge the Potomac. Uh, the engineers through uh, Governor Warren, who's the Army's chief engineer, have sent word back to Washington. We need another 700 feet of bridging material. Uh, by the way, be sure and send it by railroad because uh, the Confederates have damaged the B&O Canal and it's inoperative. The word that more bridging material is needed gets to D.C., uh, but somehow the part about send it by rail doesn't. Uh, and so the authorities in Washington dispatch uh, the extra pontoons by the canal, uh, which means they're not going to get there in time. Uh, fortunately, the federal engineers uh, have uh, the uh, windfall of Robert E. Lee's destroyed bridge uh, from Williamsport, which had been broken up when the Confederates got south of the river, uh, and its parts and pieces come sweeping down uh, the Potomac River uh, toward Berlin and the federal engineers fish those parts and pieces uh, out of the angry waters and use them to complete their uh, bridge uh, so that uh, they are able to uh, to allow the federal infantry to begin crossing there more or less on a schedule. Uh, the day after the first bridge is uh, built, uh, the uh, additional uh, uh, bridging material shows up uh, late, uh, but still there. So the federal engineers are going to be able to build a second bridge uh, for the federals to cross uh, the Potomac. And this, of course, is what the Army is going to do, but it is not necessarily what George Meade prefers to do. And he writes a letter to his wife, Margaret, who's a close confidant on July 18th of 63, in which he says that the proper policy of the Lincoln administration would be happy to get Lee out of the North, happy to get Lee out of Maryland, let him alone. It's kind of fruitless for me to chase him. He's got freedom of maneuver. He's just going to run uh, away in front of me. I'm not going to be able to bring him to battle. Uh, and beyond that, I don't even really have confidence that I can put my army uh, into a pitch battle. We should pause in Maryland and not advance until I've been reinforced, I can reorganize this army and put it on such a footing that, it, that its advance is sure to be successful. Why go and risk a battle when you can't be 100% confident that you would win it? We should wait until we are better prepared. But if this is what Meade believes should be the policy of the government, he knows that that is not what the policy of the government is, uh, and that he is expected to continue his pursuit begun at Gettysburg. And so uh, at Berlin, Maryland. Here's a picture of it. There are the two pontoons. Uh, he's going to take his army across the Potomac, and uh, also uh, he's going to get some of it over at Harper's Ferry, and they're going to swing around and then come through Keys Gap to uh, join the rest of the army uh, in the Loudoun Valley. So by uh, night on July 18th, he's got the 2nd, the 3rd, the 1st, and the 5th Corps, uh, Buford's Cavalry Division, the Artillery Reserve uh, south of the river, the 6th and the 11th Corps the 12th uh, and Kilpatrick's division uh, waiting to cross. Uh, and uh, the advance at first is kind of slow, kind of cautious. Uh, obviously, he doesn't know where the Confederates are because he's basically lost complete contact with them once they cross the river. He assumes that Lee is retreating rapidly southward, uh, looking to cross the Blue Ridge Mountains and get uh, back into central Virginia. That would be the logical thing to do as far as Meade is concerned, but he doesn't know with certainty uh, that this is uh, what the rebels are doing. And so uh, we first touch upon this real dearth of intelligence uh, that both Meade and Lee are going to suffer uh, through during the next 10 days. Uh, they have the Blue Ridge Mountains between their two armies and a flooded Shenandoah River. Uh, and there's very little contact between the armies. It's very difficult to get any kind of intelligence uh, whatsoever. And so both generals are essentially going to be moving in the dark uh, for most of this uh, campaign. But if Meade doesn't know where Lee is, the same can be said for General Kelly, 
on the western side of the Shenandoah Valley, but he has his orders and his orders are to, to do some harm to the rebels. The question that Kelly has to answer is where are the rebels and how many of them are there? Uh, and so on July 19th, he sends about 2,500 men under the command of Brigadier General William Averill, uh, mostly uh, infantry, Osama cavalry, a battery of artillery, uh, towards Martinsburg, uh, Virginia, uh, today West Virginia. Uh, and he tells Averill to be careful. If there are no Confederates in Martinsburg, he's to occupy that place. If there's just a handful of Confederates, he's to occupy the place. But if there are a lot of Confederates between him and there, uh, he is not to push it. Uh, Kelly doesn't want Averill to poke the beehive so that the overwhelming strength of the Army of Northern Virginia will swarm out and sting his small force to death. Avril gets most of the way to Martinsburg, pushing back uh, Hampton's Brigade of Cavalry, which is now under the command of Colonel Lawrence Baker, uh, following Hampton's wounding at Gettysburg. Uh, but just shy of Martinsburg, uh, Ewell sends some infantry uh, to support Baker and the appearance of better infantry convinces Avril uh, that this is uh, this is exactly the kind of scenario uh, that he had been warned against. Uh, and so he begins to withdraw back toward Martinsburg. The Confederates are following them uh, very slowly. Uh, and there's a, a day-long skirmish. Very vigorous. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the Federals are back where they started around Hedgesville. The Confederates have protected Martinsburg, uh, but the, uh, both sides now know where the other is, uh, which is something they had not known uh, earlier in the day. Uh, so you have a situation. Please mute yourself. You know, Please I was your raised by a single mom in East London. I'm one of four sisters. I know Please it. Please mute yourself. You're being disruptive. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so... Uh, Kelly now knows that the Army of Northern Virginia uh, is somewhere around Martinsburg or south of there. Ewell now knows that there is a federal force, which he estimates at about 10,000 men. Uh, it, it's up around Hedgesville. And this fighting on the 19th is going to have uh, very significant repercussions. Even though it was a fight, it didn't amount uh, to very much. On the other side of the Shenandoah Valley, Meade completes crossing the river on July 19th. Uh, he's pushing further south. He's got cavalry detachments from Kilpatrick's uh, division that have seized Snickers Gap. Uh, the first of the gaps he's after, he's got uh, troops from Buford and Kilpatrick moving down the valley, now threatening Ashby's Gap, uh, which is held only by a very small contingent of Confederate cavalry, uh, most of which had been left behind when Lee swept uh, north uh, toward uh, Gettysburg. So, uh, Meade is actually uh, accomplishing what he I had hoped to accomplish. He's got his army on the south side of the Potomac. He's got it in the Loudoun Valley safely, and he is successfully beginning to move that army in such a way that he is opening up at least the possibility of pushing through one of these gaps and getting south uh, of Lee. Now, Lee's army setting up here with Ewell's Corps around Darksville, Hill and Longstreet's Corps around Bunker Hill, uh, has not gotten much in the way of reinforcement, uh, but it has been strengthened by a single brigade, 1,200 troops under General Montgomery Course. And these troops had been part of Pickett's Division, one of two brigades from Pickett's Division that had been left behind uh, during the Gettysburg campaign. Uh, and when news of the defeat at Gettysburg had reached Richmond on July 9th, a course had been ordered uh, into the valley to reinforce the Army of Northern Virginia. His men make a 100-mile march in the span of about five days through rain and mud. Uh, they get to Winchester uh, in the late afternoon of July 19th, and he reports uh, to uh, Pickett. Uh, and Pickett says, well, look, there's your, your guys are tired. The, the roads are awful. There's no need for you to march north and rejoin us around Bunker Hill. Why don't you just keep your brigade in Winchester for the time being until we see what we're going to be uh, ordered to do. And this very casual decision is going to turn out to have the most important repercussions uh, for events going forward. Robert E. Lee, like George Meade, is trying to figure out what's going on without having any real information on the enemy. Uh, 
Uh, Lee, of course, is, is very good at sort of getting in the minds of Union generals, but he has only been dealing with Meade for a couple of weeks. Uh, and uh, he supposes that the most dangerous thing that the Federals could do was to enter the Loudoun Valley, move rapidly south, try to get control of the mountain passes, and cut the Army of Northern Virginia off uh, in the upper, uh, the, the northern reaches, or the lower, geographically speaking, uh, end of the valley. And although Lee has no evidence whatsoever that points toward the Army of the Potomac having crossed the river, other than reports of Union cavalry hovering around some of those mountain passes, uh, he decides to act on the assumption uh, that Meade is a very good general, and he will therefore do the thing that is most dangerous uh, to the Confederate Army. Uh, so on the uh, late afternoon of July 19th of 63, he writes uh, James Longstreet commanding the First Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia, and he asks him to uh, take his army uh, to uh, the Shenandoah River on the other side of Ashby's Gap. Uh, if he uh, sees that that's a good place to cross the river, uh, he can do that. But if it doesn't look a good place, then he should go down uh, to Chester's Gap near Front Royal, across the river there, uh, and then move through the, the mountain passes and return to Culpeper County uh, and take a position somewhere along the upper uh, Rappahannock River uh, so that he would be in a position to block any Union thrust toward Richmond, because this is the other a danger that Lee has to consider is that Meade uh, will simply ignore what the Army of Northern Virginia is doing and move east uh, into central Virginia, try and cross the Rappahannock and maybe even the Rapidan uh, and put himself strategically between the Army of Northern Virginia and the Confederate uh, capital. So uh, Lee has ordered Longstreet to move. Longstreet will begin that, uh, that movement the next morning on July uh, 20th. Uh, and uh, while Longstreet is preparing to move that same evening, uh, George Meade gets roundabout word about the fighting that had gone on near Martinsburg the day before. And this comes to him sort of obliquely from a garrison commander uh, in Hagerstown, Maryland, who had talked to one of Avril's officers. Uh, Meade has lost all telegraphic communication uh, with the North when he crossed the Potomac. So he's really kind of out of touch. But this message gets to him by courier, and for the first time, Meade has some solid information about where the Army of Northern Virginia is. And to his surprise, he finds out that it's around Bunker Hill and Darksville, uh, that the Confederates are near Martinsburg uh, and threatening Kelly's forces near Hedgesville. And this flabbergasts Meade because this indicates that the Army of Northern Virginia is not doing what he thought it would be doing, what it would be logical for it to do, and that would be to retreat as rapidly southward uh, through the Shenandoah Valley as possible to cross the mountains and get back into central Virginia uh, before the Union uh, Army has a chance to intervene. Uh, and uh, this stunning news suddenly makes me remember something that he had read the uh, day before uh, in a Southern newspaper, and that was a report that massive reinforcements are being sent uh, to the Army of Northern Virginia. The troops are coming to reinforce it from Tennessee and from the Carolinas. Uh, and when Meade had gotten those, he'd sent word uh, to Halleck uh, asking if this is true. Halleck had sent word back saying, don't worry, uh, not a man is going to come to reinforce uh, Lee. Uh, you're infinitely superior than him. Uh, and Meade had taken Halleck at his word, but now Meade has to consider that maybe these reports are true, because why else would Lee still be in the uh, northern reaches of the Shenandoah Valley? There's no reason for him to stay there. There's no reason for him to put his army at risk from the very kind of maneuver uh, that Meade is conducting, unless, unless those stories are true. And Meade is right in fearing that the Army of Northern Virginia is being massively reinforced. And if reinforcements are coming to Lee, Lee could be preparing to reinvade the North, to cross the Potomac again, or perhaps even more frightening, he would let Meade continue to plow south into the Loudoun Valley. And once Meade is far enough south, Lee could cross 
from the Shenandoah into the Loudoun Valley in sort of the mirror image of the kind of uh, threat that Meade is hoping to levy against Lee and get between Washington and the Army of the Potomac, cut it off from its, its source of reinforcement and resupply. Is that what Lee's planning to do? There's no evidence one way or the other, but the fact that he's lingering in a place that he shouldn't linger uh, seems to suggest that this is at least a possibility. And with a battered Army of the Potomac, Meade is not willing to take any chances. Lee has proven his audacity uh, too many times in the past to simply discount the idea uh, that he would do the most audacious thing that could be imagined. And so uncertain as to what the Army of Northern Virginia is doing, Meade decides uh, to take counsel of caution, and he orders his infantry to stop its southward movement until he can get some intelligence clarity. The cavalry will keep going south, it will keep aiming toward these mountain passes, but the infantry is going to stop and wait until me can figure out what Lee is really up to. And as a result, the infantry of the Army of the Potomac is not gonna take another step south for 36 critical hours. And giving Robert E. Lee 36 hours of grace usually doesn't work uh, to your advantage, and it's not going to work uh, to the federal advantage uh, here uh, as well. So on July 20th, Longstreet's Corps begins to move toward Chester's Gap. So Longstreet leaves Bunker Hill. Uh, he goes over here uh, to Millwood on the other side of the Shenandoah River from Ashby's Gap. Uh, and concludes there's no threat here, even though federal cavalry has seized the gap earlier in the day. Uh, and so he plans to continue his march tomorrow uh, down to Chester's Gap, uh, where he can cross the mountains and go back toward Culpeper. While Longstreet is marching from Bunker Hill through Winchester down to Millwood, Forces Brigade, which remember had been left at Winchester, has been directed to go straight to Front Royal. Uh, and by the end of the day, he's camping at Cedarville, which is only about five miles away uh, from Front Royal. Uh, so this is just sort of a, a routine thing. Hey, you're closer here than there. You might as well go that way instead of this way. Uh, but again, this is going to have enormous consequences for what's going to uh, take place uh, the next uh, day. Uh, Lee, in the interim, has sent word. Uh, back to uh, Yule and A.P. Hill to prepare to follow Longstreet soon. Uh, and everybody is going to be heading toward the same place. And that place is Front Royal. And Front Royal matters a great deal because sitting uh, on the western side of the Blue Ridge Mountains, Front Royal is the spot where two gaps through the mountains come together. And that's Manassas Gap here to the north where you see that number one and Chester's Gap here, where you see that number three. This is a, a drawing by Edwin Forbes uh, in uh, 1862. Uh, if you want to see it on a map where it's a little bit clearer, here you go. Uh, so here's the North Fork of the Shenandoah, the South Fork coming together at Front Royal to form the Shenandoah River. Remember, this is all flooded. There's the little town of Front Royal. Here's Chester's Gap. There's Manassas Gap and here are the Blue Ridge Mountains. And controlling these passes is of critical importance because Lee wants to move through Chester's Gap to get out of the valley and back into central Virginia. Meade is envisioning being able to push through Manassas Gap uh, into the valley at Front Royal and cut Lee off uh, in the northern reaches of the valley uh, where he might be destroyed. So, on the morning of July 21st, 1863, you have a situation where Union Cavalry, a brigade under the command of Wesley Merritt, uh, is moving into Manassas Gap and going to the apex of the pass around the little town of Linden. The Corses Brigade passes through Front Royal. He sends most of his troops and uh, the little artillery he has with him to Chester's Gap, which of course is the one the Confederates uh, plan to use. Uh, but Manassas Gap has to be watched. And so he detaches uh, the uh, 17th of Virginia Cavalry, uh, I'm sorry, Infantry, under the command of Colonel Robert Simpson uh, to go up and to guard uh, Manassas Gap. And that's an inspired choice because Simpson 
uh, is a pre-war militia officer. He's, he's a good uh, regimental commander, uh, but he was from Front Royal. Uh, one of his companies uh, was raised in Front Royal. So he knows this terrain very well. Uh, and he marches his troops up toward Linden, uh, stopping at a place called Wapping House, uh, which was a former stagecoach stop uh, that had basically been put out of business by the uh, advent of the uh, Manassas Gap Railroad. And just as uh, Simpson's 250 men uh, stack their muskets and send out their skirmishers, uh, the uh, lead contingent of Merritt's Cavalry Brigade uh, shows up on the scene uh, and it attacks them. And this begins a day of fighting uh, in uh, Manassas Gap. Uh, Simpson loses about 25, 30 of his men as prisoners uh, in that initial Yankee cavalry surge, but he rallies his troops very quickly uh, and they put up a very stout fight. Uh, Merritt is going to progressively throw more and more of his troops into the battle uh, and uh, the Confederates are going to manage to hold uh, against very serious odds. And fortunately for them, at the start of the engagement, they've sent a, a courier racing back uh, to uh, Front Royal with orders to find Longstreet's Corps and ask for reinforcements. And as that courier gets to Front Royal, uh, he runs into the advance of Pickett's Brigade or Pickett's Division, uh, which is leading Longstreet's Corps. Uh, and Pickett, understanding uh, that there's a crisis at foot, hurries his troops uh, through Front Royal and sends one brigade under Cabell, this is Armistead's old brigade, uh, to uh, reinforce Simpson uh, in Manassas Gap and sends his other two brigades, the former brigades of Garnet and uh, Kemper under Peyton and Mayo uh, to reinforce uh, Corse's brigade uh, in Chester's Gap where there's been some light skirmishing with Gamble's uh, federal cavalry uh, from uh, Buford's division. And so the Confederate reinforcements show up here just in time uh, to blunt what Merritt has been trying to do, which is get to Front Royal. Uh, the Confederates have put up a stout resistance that surprised the Yankees, uh, and Confederate prisoners have been telling very good lies. And so they, they tell Merritt uh, that, they, that they are part of a division of troops instead of a brigade, uh, and Merritt uh, believes that, and he passes word back up that there's a division of Confederate infantry inside Manassas Gap, and of course, Gamble is sending word back that he's run into Confederates uh, at Chester's Gap uh, as well. Uh, if Union infantry had kept moving south on July 21st, there might have been Federal foot soldiers to slide into these two gaps uh, that night to uh, block them up. Uh, and deny the Confederates use of them. But remember, Meade's infantry has spent the day uh, of July uh, 20th and, uh, or July 21st basically uh, taking it easy uh, and, and not really doing much of anything. So the federal cavalry is kind of out here uh, on its own. At the other end of the Shenandoah Valley, uh, Lee has sent word to A.P. Hill uh, to telling him to follow Longstreet down through Chester's Gap. Uh, and he sent word to Yule saying that you'll probably follow in a few days, uh, but for now, I want you to stay where you are. Uh, and if there's anything that I need to know, uh, you know, about the enemy, be sure to tell me. Well, you'll have something to tell Lee. Uh, and so on the 20th, he informed Lee about the fight the previous day around Martinsburg. And he says, look, there are about 10,000 Federals uh, up around Hedgesville, and I would like to go destroy them. Uh, and Lee likes the sound of that. He likes the sound of Yule being aggressive. And although he doesn't think Kelly's force is quite that strong, he gives permission. Uh, and so on the afternoon of uh, July 20th, Yule and his division commanders, Robert Rhodes, Allegheny Johnson, uh, and Jubal Early met uh, in Martinsburg at the home of one of his uh, uh, adjutant generals, uh, a very lovely plantation called Boydville. And here they plotted the destruction of Kelly's force. And the plan uh, was for Rhodes and Johnson to move directly north from Darksville, uh, basically moving precisely against Hedgesville from the direction that the Federals would expect. But at the same time that this is happening, Early and his division with Hampton's cavalry gun under Baker will have slipped into uh, Back Creek Valley on the other side of North Mountain the evening before, and they will advance uh, up the valley to strike the Federals from the rear. And so while Yule's main force is attracting Kelly's attention, Early's flanking force will slide around 
uh, and hit it from behind and the Federals will be caught in a vice and they'll be destroyed. The very good plan, it might have worked, but there was a problem. And that problem was that there was a black slave who was tending to the needs of the Confederate officer at Boydville. And that slave belonged to the Pendleton family uh, who were unionists. And when he had been sent to Boydville, his owner, Lucinda Pendleton, had told him to keep his eyes and ears open when he's around Confederate generals. Uh, and so after the strategy conference, he comes back, he tells Mrs. Pendleton what he's heard. Uh, she tells the slave to go north and warn Kelly uh, the black man, of course, is not allowed through Confederate picket line. Uh, so she sends her son, her 10-year-old son, with an empty basket claiming he's going to go pick blackberries. Uh, and he gets through. And he gets up to Kelly. He says, uh, you're all going to be killed. The Confederates are coming after you. Uh, and at first, Kelly thinks that the young man is, is spinning a yarn. Uh, but he decides to be careful. And he sends cavalry patrols into Back Creek Valley and they find the Confederates camped around Tomahawk Springs, and suddenly Kelly knows uh, that the threat is very real. And so he begins a retreat that night, and on the morning of July 21st, as the Confederates launch the final movements to destroy him, he gets across uh, the Potomac River, and Hampton's Cavalry Brigade shows up just in time to see the last boatload of Yankees uh, get back into Maryland. Uh, so on July 21st in Manassas Gap, the Confederates had fought a very important delay in action, uh, and they managed to uh, keep the Federals from beginning to come through the Blue Ridge Mountains. On the other side of the Shenandoah Valley, disappointment, uh, but you have shoved Kelly out of your way. You don't have to worry uh, about him anymore. But the fact that the Confederates had launched an offensive toward Kelly is, when the news of it gets to me, going to play into his concern that Lee is being reinforced and is preparing to take the offensive. Doesn't this look like a Confederate offensive movement? Uh, and so Meade's getting conflicting intelligence now. Uh, some of the intelligence points toward the Confederates going over to the offensive, but some of the observers he's gotten up in the mountains now looking into the Shenandoah Valley uh, are seeing long columns of Confederate infantry and massive uh, columns of wagons streaming south uh, toward Winchester and Front Royal. And so, which is it? Is Lee about to assume the offensive or is Lee retreating? Meade can't know with certainty and he doesn't want to move until he has clarity on the situation. So on the night of July 21st, 1863, here's the situation. The Union infantry is still sitting in its camps. It hasn't moved uh, for more than a day. Uh, the Confederates have forces in Manassas and Chester's Gap, but the Federals have a cavalry brigade in each of those uh, in, to try and block the passes. Hill has marched south to Winchester. Robert E. Lee and his headquarters uh, accompany them. Ewell has turned Rhodes and Johnson's divisions around and taken them back to Darksville, but early along with Hampton's brigade is up at Hedgesville. So now they're the northernmost part of uh, the Army of Northern Virginia, and they're, they're some distance away from uh, Ewell and the rest of his corps, and that too is going to have uh, consequences. So on the morning of July 22nd, everything is kind of poised for potentially a great big battle as both the Union and Confederate armies converge uh, toward Front Royal. At noon, Meade is finally going to get enough information from his Signal Corps observers uh, in the mountains uh, to conclude that Lee is, in fact, retreating, uh, not going over to the offensive. Uh, but on that same day, the Confederates are now beginning to push their way through uh, Manassas uh, and, I'm sorry, uh, through Chester's Gap while they continue to hold at Manassas Gap. So uh, Hill is going to come in. Uh, he's going to replace Longstreet's units in Manassas Gap. Uh, as Longstreet begins to push through Chester's Gap, he runs into William Gamble's cavalry brigade with a battery of artillery. And although the Confederates, of course, vastly outnumber the Federals, in this narrow mountain pass, those numbers are all but useless. And the uh, Confederate brigade at the front of Longstreet's column uh, under William Woodford uh, looks at the ground that Gamble's holding, says, wow, that, that's going to be tough ground to attack. Uh, it'd probably be pretty bloody 
to try and shove the Yankees out of the way. Uh, and so Wooford proposes that instead they outflank uh, the Federals. Uh, and what he proposes is sending Pickett's division, or at least the two brigades of it uh, that are with him, uh, over the mountains to come in and, and hit the uh, Federal cavalry from the rear uh, and the flank. And when Wooford sees uh, Pickett come in to do that, he will start a frontal attack. And Longstreet agrees to this plan, even though he knows it will take almost an entire day uh, for Pickett's troops to get uh, into position. Uh, obviously, he's not feeling very threatened by whatever the Army of the Potomac is doing. And so Pickett's men make this long flank march. Uh, they uh, get into position. Uh, they begin to move against Gamble. Wooford begins to move against him at the same time. Gamble realizes that he's been uh, put into a trap, uh, and he puts his men on his horses, and he gallops away, uh, and uh, he manages to escape. Uh, and uh, this is very disappointing to General Wolford. Uh, Longstreet's not surprised that, that men on horses are going to be able to run away from men uh, on foot. Uh, but nonetheless, at almost no cost, uh, the Confederates have cleared the exit to Chester's Gap, and now Longstreet's Corps and Hill's Corps begin streaming through the mountains uh, toward the upper Rappahannock River uh, and, uh, and uh, Culpeper County. So here we are at night on July 22nd. Longstreet is beginning to go through Chester's Gap, Hill's right behind him. Uh, now uh, uh, Benning's uh, brigade is holding Manassas Gap. Uh, Stewart has brought most of his cavalry down uh, toward the gap. Ewell has taken Rhodes and Johnson's divisions to Winchester. Early's now backed up to Bunker Hill. And Meade has finally concluded uh, that he can be, resume his march south. And so he's beginning to shove his infantry uh, toward Manassas Gap. Uh, he's still being careful. So he leaves the 12th Corps at Snickers Gap the second corps backed up by the fifth corps at Ashby's Gap, just in case he's wrong. And Lee suddenly goes over to the offensive and tries to shove his way into the Loudoun Valley through those. Uh, but the third corps uh, and the sixth corps are directed toward Manassas Gap. And so by the evening of July 22nd, the third corps is almost at the entrance to the gap, the sixth corps not far away. And that night, a division from the Third Corps is sent into Manassas Gap uh, to relieve Merritt's Cavalry Brigade. And the next morning, the rest of the Second, uh, the Third Corps, uh, and then followed by the Fifth Corps, uh, is going to go streaming into Manassas Gap. Federal observers up in the mountains have gotten a little bit confused about what the Confederates are doing, but even more confused about what Confederates they're looking at. So Meade knows that Merritt and Gamble have been facing Longstreet's troops. And so Longstreet's Corps is somewhere down around here. But looking through uh, from the mountains through a hazy atmosphere down into the Shenandoah Valley, uh, the federal uh, observers have come to believe that Ewell's Corps, or at least the two divisions at Winchester, are in fact A.P. Hill's troops, which they've lost track of, and that Early's sole division up here at Bunker Hill is Yule's entire corps. So Meade is misconstruing the situation here because he's getting bad intelligence. Both Lee and uh, I'm sorry, Longstreet and Hill, with Lee's headquarters, are in Chester's Gap, beginning to redeploy into central Virginia. Only Yule's corps is north of that point. But Meade believes that two-thirds of the Army of the Potomac is around Winchester and Bunker Hill. So if he could shove his way through Manassas Gap and seize Front Royal, he might catch both Hill and Yule in the northern reaches of the Shenandoah Valley. Longstreet will elude him, but if he can get the Army of Northern Virginia into the valley and throw its entirety against two-thirds of Lee's army, he might destroy two of three rebel corps and take the war a long step closer uh, to a successful uh, conclusion. So on the morning of July 23rd, federal infantry begins to move into Manassas Gap, even as Longstreet and Hill's Corps and then Stewart's Cavalry are moving eastward through Chester's Gap. So you have this very interesting situation where 
Meade is trying to shove his forces west toward Front Royal through Manassas Gap and just a few miles to the south with the mountains in between them, Longstreet, Hill, and Stewart are pushing in the opposite direction. So like two ships passing in the night. But Meade does not know this. Meade thinks that there's a chance to trap and destroy uh, two of Lee's corps. And the man who is in charge of being the spearhead of that effort is Major General William F. French, who has recently taken command of the Third Corps uh, following the Gettysburg wounding of, uh, of uh, uh, our old friend, uh, General uh, Sickles, uh, who me does not care much for. Uh, French has been a brigade and division commander, uh, but he is fighting has all been done in the Second Corps. He's a newcomer to the Third Corps. Uh, he'd been sent to take command of the Garrison Harpers Ferry at the start of the Gettysburg campaign, so he missed that battle, but he brings that garrison to reinforce the Army of the Potomac uh, uh, as it marches uh, in pursuit of Lee following that great battle. Uh, and Meade assigns the this fresh division to the Third Corps, which has been so badly uh, mauled at Gettysburg. And by seniority, then French takes command. Uh, French is, in fact, the third ranking major general in the Army of the Potomac behind Meade uh, and Sedgwick. Uh, French um, has had a hard war. Uh, he uh, got to attack the sunken road at Antietam. He got to attack the Stone Wall at Fredericksburg. He got to try and stop Stonewall Jackson's flank attack at Chancellorsville. Uh, and through all of those experiences, uh, French has learned uh, a good portion of caution. And I think we can understand why under those circumstances, he might be uh, inclined to be careful, especially since he's commanding a corps for the very first uh, time. Uh, and so French comes up uh, toward Linden in Manassas Gap. And while he's arriving, uh, a Confederate brigade under, uh, this is Wright's Brigade of Georgians from Hill's Corps, uh, has marched into Manassas Gap to relieve Benning's Brigade of responsibility for protecting that key terrain. Uh, and Wright's not with them uh, that day. Wright has gotten himself uh, in a fight with his division commander, Richard Anderson, who's arrested him. Uh, and so uh, Colonel Edward Walker is commanding uh, this brigade of Georgians that had been badly shot up uh, at, at Gettysburg. So it's only 600 men strong. Uh, and when it gets into Manassas Gap and Walker talks to Benning, Benning says, well, it's, it's quiet here. There's nothing to worry about. There's a brigade of Yankee cavalry uh, a, a mile or so away in Linden, but they're not inclined to cause any trouble. And so Benning marches away. Walker deploys his troops into two parallel lines, uh, putting uh, the 3rd Georgia Infantry and two companies of the 2nd Georgia uh, Battalion on high ground called Wapping Heights uh, in a skirmish line. Uh, and then about 600 yards behind them, the, the 48th Georgia, the 22nd Georgia, and the last two companies of the 2nd Georgia Battalion uh, onto a skirmish line on, on a, a parallel ridge. This whole area is kind of known as, as Wapping Heights. And the Confederates deploy, and for a while, everything is very calm. And then to the horror of Colonel Walker, suddenly an entire Federal Infantry Corps shows up in front of him. Not Yankee cavalry anymore, and not just a brigade, but an entire corps. Uh, and he has signalman wig back, wigwag back a message toward Front Royal uh, that he he needs help and he needs it fast. Uh, by this point, uh, Richard Yule and Robert Rhodes have gotten into Front Royal. They're moving ahead of Rhodes and Johnson's infantry. Uh, those two men race into Manassas Gap to see what Walker is talking about. And they get up here and they look through their uh, binoculars and they see that, in fact, General, uh, rather Colonel Walker, is not making things up. Uh, there's maybe 20,000 federal infantry in front of his 600 Georgians, and the divisions of Rhodes and Johnson are still marching south from Winchester. They're like 20 miles away uh, from Manassas Gap. And so uh, there's a great danger here that French would overwhelm Walker, plow through to Front Royal, and cut the Confederate Second Corps off in the Shenandoah Valley. Now, Meade thinks he might cut off both Hill and Yule, we know that Hill's already in Chester's Gap going the other way, 
but there's a real chance here for the Federals to destroy a third of the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, understanding the danger, Ewell tells Colonel Walker that he's got to hold his ground if it costs him every man that he has. Uh, hold fast and I'll send reinforcements. And he and Rhodes go galloping back to hurry up their troops. And so now Walker and his Georgians are faced with trying to stymie the efforts of an entire federal corps. They're lucky, however, in a number of ways. First off, the terrain here is, is very, very rugged. Uh, it, the, the mountains, uh, wherever the, the ground is smooth and conducive to farming, have been cleared. Uh, but on the steep sides of these hills, there are lots of uh, brambles and trees and that kind of stuff. Uh, in addition uh, to this pretty good defensive terrain, there, there are a lot of loose rocks around that they can stack uh, into uh, makeshift breastworks. Uh, but even more in their favor is the fact that General French is new to Corps Command, and he is inclined toward caution. Uh, he, he looks at the ground to the left and right of his Corps as it marches into Manassas Gap. And he sees these towering mountains uh, covered with dense forest, uh, and he imagines that they could be filled with Confederate infantry. It's almost like he saw too many of those 1950s Westerns where, you know, the cavalry rise into the Box Canyon and then the Indians are suddenly on all the mountains, you know, silhouetted against the horizon. Uh, and so as he marches into this kind of terrain, he's very fearful that he's walking into a trap. So he spends lots of time detaching regiments and batteries to guard this little road or that little road or to climb up onto that uh, precipice to make sure that there are no rebels there. He's really disinclined to push things until George Sykes and the Fifth Corps uh, get up behind him, but it's going to take some hours for them to do that. Uh, and so his caution uh, is going to prove incredibly helpful uh, to the Georgians. Eventually, about 11 o'clock in the morning, so almost half the day's gone away now and the Federals haven't pushed at all, uh, General French sends a skirmish line uh, out to contest Wapping Heights. And so a prolonged skirmish that's going to go on for four hours uh, begins. Uh, and uh, the troops are hot shotting away at each other, not really inflicting very many casualties, although General uh, Colonel Walker is hit badly in the leg forced to leave the battlefield, uh, and Captain Charles Andrews of the 3rd Georgia takes command of the brigade. Uh, the, the fighting is sort of lackadaisical, and for, for men who had seen the horrors of Gettysburg, uh, this was quite the contrast to the fight in Pennsylvania. Uh, it was almost a gentlemanly contest, it made even more so by the fact that both of these armies are almost out of food. Uh, and uh, so the soldiers are very hungry, but they're fighting in a region that is simply overrun with blackberries. There are blackberry bushes everywhere. And the men on both sides of the battle line have basically been living off the, the blackberries for several days. And so the way this fighting went is the, a soldier would load his musket, he would shoot, he would grab a fistful of blackberries, eat them, reload his musket and shoot. And this is going on on both sides. One soldier said it was like almost opera buffet uh, kind of uh, combat. Uh, and this goes on until three o'clock. At three o'clock, the head of Sykes Fifth Corps is finally within sight. Uh, General Meade has come up, although he's not going to interfere in operations. And at this juncture, uh, General French tells his leading division commander, uh, Hobart Ward, to go ahead and push the rebels off Wapping Heights. It's something the Federals could have done four hours ago, but just now is the order given. And so Ward, uh, pulls two of his skirmish regiments together, forms an assault column, advances, and very easily uh, pushes the Confederates off of Wapping Heights. But it's not a panic. Uh, the Confederates go retreating back 600 yards to their second line in what one Union participant called a gentle cow trot. Uh, so uh, they're hardly scared. The Federals sweep up onto Wapping Heights, uh, but then they see that there's another Confederate line 600 yards uh, to the west on even more formidable uh, terrain. Uh, and uh, for Captain Andrews and the Georgians, this is a huge success. So Andrews is, has conducted the fight very capably. He's very proud of his men for managing to hold out against an entire Union Corps for most of the day. 
Uh, and as the Confederates pull back to this line, uh, they hear that Rhodes' division is coming through Front Royal. Uh, Johnson's division is right behind them, having made a force march through incredible heat. This whole campaign is conducted with temperatures in the 90s, and, and humidity is very high. So this is really rough stuff uh, for uh, the troops. Uh, but having gotten Wapping Heights now, French decides uh, that he wants the second piece of high ground, and he orders the Excelsior Brigade under the command of Francis Spinola, who's a replacement uh, uh, for uh, the normal commander who's on sick leave. Spinola is a political general. He has no military talent whatsoever, uh, but he gets the job. Fortunately, he has very good troops, and Spinola is at least brave. Uh, so he uh, goes into the valley between these two hills, and then he launches an attack uh, up uh, the very steep hillside. In some places, almost absolutely uh, perpendicular against the Confederate skirmish line. And as the Federals advance, they are taking fire not only from the Georgians in front, uh, but the sharpshooter battalions of Rhodes Division have arrived on the scene and taken position uh, to the north and are firing into uh, the federal flank. So the federals are taking fire from several directions. Uh, and uh, in some places, the ground is so steep that Yankee soldiers are having to crawl on their hands and knees to get up. They're grabbing small trees and stuff to pull themselves uh, forward. Uh, and one of the interesting things about this is that uh, Rhodes troops are coming into line uh, behind the Confederates. They're on high ground. All the federal troops over here are on high ground, and they're looking down on this fight. Uh, and both sides are cheering their comrades like this is a football game, like they're in a stadium looking down uh, on the field. Uh, the Excelsiors managed to break the Confederate line. It is, after all, very thin and almost in ammunition. Uh, Spinola is, is wounded and knocked out of the fight. A lot of the Yankee troops are hit uh, and, and killed or wounded. Uh, the Confederates are forced to retreat, so the Federals get this high ground. Uh, but by the time they get it, uh, the situation now has changed completely because Rhodes has got his division into position. He's got a brigade over here to reinforce Wright. Johnson's division has shown up at Front Royal. Longstreet is completely through uh, Manassas Gap. Hill is now on his way through. And although French has managed to get right up to the last barrier between him and Front Royal, uh, it's night now. And so he's not going to be able to do anything more. So what's the situation as far as General Meade understands it? General Meade has intelligence that he's got prisoners from all three Confederate infantry corps. Obviously, over the preceding days, he captured troops from Longstreet. Now he's got troops from, uh, from Hill, uh, courtesy of Wright's fight. Uh, but he's also got some prisoners from Ewell, uh, and his observers have seen some Confederate troops leave Chester's Gap and come back to Front Royal. Now, this is, in fact, Stewart's horse artillery that got tired of the, the traffic jam here and decides it's going to take a different route uh, down the valley to cross the mountains. But so Federal observers are seeing some Confederate troops come out of Chester's Gap toward Front Royal. They still think that Ewell's Corps, which is marching from Winchester toward Front Royal, uh, I'm sorry, Early's division is in fact Ewell's entire corps. And so Meade believes that he has almost the whole Army of Northern Virginia in front of him here. And if he can shove his way through Manassas Gap the next day, he has a chance to cut most of it off and destroy it. So he's already got the fifth corps in the map. Now he orders the second corps and the 12th corps to come up and prepare uh, to uh, to drive through Manassas Gap the next day. French is ordered to attack first thing in the morning. And that evening, Meade concentrates about 35,000 infantry, two and a half corps around the little village of Linden. And there were, in fact, so many Federals in this space that it was said that men could not find space to lay down. They had to sit uh, with their backs up against each other. It's so crowded here. Uh, and Meade is concentrating this giant effort to shove through Manassas Gap, capture Front Royal, and cut off a chunk of the Army of Northern Virginia in the Shenandoah Valley on July 23rd. 
He does have some worries, though. He's running very low on rations. He's had no resupply since he's crossed the Potomac, uh, and now he's only got a day or two's worth of food left, and he has to send an order to his officers to cut rations to conserve food because if we're going to have a big battle and then try and, and capitalize on this battle that we hope to win, we need to make our food supply last as long as we possibly can. But the Federals go to bed that night in their hungry overcrowded, uncomfortable conditions, thinking that tomorrow, tomorrow there might begin the battle that will be the actual culmination of the Gettysburg campaign. But we know that's not going to happen because Hill and Longstreet have already gone through Manassas Gap toward Culpeper Courthouse. Early, no longer needed, is told to divert through Strasburg go down to New Market and cross the mountain at Fisher's Gap. And that evening, Rhodes and Johnson pull out of Manassas Gap, march through Front Royal, and make camp below the town. And at dawn the next day, they are marching hard toward Lurie. Uh, and by the time that the Federals uh, push through uh, or begin their advance the next morning, uh, the Confederates are gone. And so the Excelsiors send forward their skirmishers and they go three miles without finding anything with a few Confederate dead and a few stragglers. Word goes back to Meade that there are no rebels in front of them. Meade suspects what has happened, uh, but he orders French to go ahead and push through Front Royal, but he tells everybody else to hold pat until he finds out what's actually going on. Uh, French uh, gets his leading units to Front Royal just in time to see the distant dust cloud of Ewell's Corps disappear over the horizon. And Meade now realizes that the Confederates have once again gotten away from it. And he's going to have to send yet another message to Henry Halleck and Abraham Lincoln. Having promised that the decisive battle of the war was about to be fought at Williamsport, he had had to report that Lee had gotten away. Now, having promised that he's about to fight that decisive battle in Front Royal, he must again report that Lee has gotten away. For the Army of the Potomac, almost out of supplies, there's no option now but to pivot to the east and to march hard on Warrington, where a connection can be made with the Orange and Alexandria Railroad and supplies of all kind, which are desperately needed, uh, rushed to the Army from the depots in Washington. So the Federals are going to march north. Uh, this is Alfred Wode's drawing of them leaving Manassas Gap. Uh, they're going to head toward Warrington. Lee is, of course, marching toward Culpeper Courthouse, and suddenly we have some 23 miles separating the two armies, as well as the Rappahannock River. Uh, and this is actually the point uh, where the Gettysburg campaign is going to come uh, to an end, not on the morning of July 14th along the banks of the Potomac, uh, but uh, uh, around July 24, 25, on either side of the Rappahannock River uh, in uh, central uh, Virginia. And that brings us to the end of our story. Great, Jeff, great presentation. Uh, uh, did a great job. And clarifying when the battle actually ended, uh, quite a different uh, perspective. Um, I do have a, a couple of questions for you. Uh, one was, um, and this was probably a little bit, this is earlier in the presentation, which was, why didn't Meade head towards Richmond, you know, forcing Lee to, you know, change his direction? Uh, part of that is that his orders, remember, are to follow Lee and cut him up wherever he may have gone. And remember that the philosophy of the Lincoln administration since McClellan's failed peninsula campaign is that Richmond is not the target of the Army of the Potomac, that Lee's army is the target of the Army of the Potomac. Uh, and uh, therefore the job is to chase it down and destroy it, destroy the Army of the, uh, Northern Virginia. Richmond falls like ripe fruit. Right. Uh, another question was, what were the conditions of the primary and secondary roads as they're having this race down the Shenandoah and the uh, other valley? Yeah, so uh, obviously the Shenandoah is flooded, and so uh, the Confederates have a hard time fording it. Lee orders a pontoon bridge built 
uh, at Front Royal that his wagons will be able to use uh, and uh, Ewell's Corps will be able to use it, but Hill and Longstreet's men have to, to, to ford both the uh, north and south uh, forks uh, of the Shenandoah, and that is that is with great difficulty. But the rain has stopped, and so the roads are dry, and it's heat and dust uh, more than anything uh, that are plaguing the two armies at this point. So let me see if anything else. Uh, again, you're getting a lot of great uh, commendations for everybody finding it an excellent presentation, and indeed it was. I think those are the majority of the um, uh, questions. Let me see. Uh, we had a very good attendance. Um, I'm not sure if you could see, but we had about 140 people on at uh, certain points uh, here. Um, I should, uh, let me open it up and see if anybody has any other questions for Jeff? Um, I will make this uh, presentation available, uh, the recording that is. Um, all you have to do is just send an email to um, uh, the email address uh, NJ Civil War with two R's D at AOL.com, and I'll be happy to send it out. And with regards to the libraries, uh, I'll do that at any rate. And let me just see if Rich had anything else to add. I see that uh, somebody uh, asked the question that, about Lee and, and Meade both wanting to resign after Gettysburg. Of course, Meade has demanded to be replaced uh, after that set to uh, with, uh, with Lincoln and Halleck. Uh, but over the next half year, Meade is going to offer or demand to be replaced about four times. Uh, he's going to have a very, very difficult relationship with Lincoln and Halleck and Stanton, uh, and it's one of the, the the things that's going to have a uh, uh, a big impact here uh, on um, on the way that the war is 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 going to go uh, forward. Uh, and so uh, you have uh, that problem. Uh, Lee uh, at the beginning of August is going to ask Jefferson Davis to find a younger, a more capable man. Uh, uh, to take his place. Uh, he, he's worried that he's lost the confidence of his army at Gettysburg, uh, and uh, he's very distressed about all the criticism in the newspapers and that kind of thing, uh, and, and his health is, is failing. He, he had a uh, perhaps a mild heart attack in, in the spring, uh, and he just doesn't have the strength and stamina anymore uh, to do the job the way he thinks it ought to be done. Uh, which is to make personal reconnaissance and that kind of thing. He has to rely on staff officers, and he doesn't like to do that. Uh, but uh, Jefferson Davis sends back a very heartfelt letter uh, telling him that he can't think of a better man to command the Army of Northern Virginia, uh, that he certainly hasn't lost the confidence of the Army or the thinking men of the country, uh, that he agrees it's it's a bummer to have to put up with the ignorant and the newspaper editors and, the, and, and people like that, uh, but they are not the people who really matter. Uh, and so he, he basically refuses in a very heartfelt way uh, to, to uh, part with Robert E. Lee and just urges him to take care of himself because the South mm -hmm. can't lose him. Uh, whereas uh, Lincoln's uh, attitude toward Meade is very different. Uh, it's clear that Meade has disappointed him. Uh, that's going to uh, trouble Meade for the next uh, three or four months. Uh, and uh, and Lincoln, uh, when he hears that Meade is, is planning to continue the pursuit of Lee after he's resupplied at Warrington, uh, uh, sends a message to Halleck uh, to Meade uh, saying that I don't want General Meade to advance on the assumption that we're expecting him to produce a battle. Uh, in fact, if he couldn't uh, if he couldn't fight Lee when he was trapped on the banks of the Potomac, it's it's sort of ridiculous to think that there's anything he can do now in Central Virginia. Uh, which is sort of a backhanded slap in the face. Uh, did General Meade spread his troops out too much? And did he, uh, the military, the army, have a different strategy than President Lincoln, which is to exhaust the South, delay the, the entire war until the South couldn't function anymore? And Lincoln was well, trying to so, be popular um, let him and answer. avoid death. Yeah. So those so are two questions. The, the, the army looked too spread out on the field to me to be successful. And number two, I don't think President Lincoln's aware of the uh, 
the overall strategy, which is to exhaust the South and then cut its cut its underbelly open. Uh, so, you know, I think you're you're thinking yourself uh, forward there and, and enjoying a little bit of hindsight. Uh, the, the goal is to destroy Confederate armies, uh, whether you're Eastern Theater, Western Theater, Trans-Mississippi Theater. Uh, the Army of Northern Virginia uh, is is the real threat. Uh, and, and if it's gone, everything else is going to fall. Uh, there's there's no question about it. Uh, the Army of the Potomac wasn't too spread out. Uh, Meade, Meade's a pretty good tactician. Uh, his strategy was pretty good. His intelligence was bad. Uh, he was uh, arguably a little too cautious buying into this newspaper report that Lee would be reinforced doesn't make a lot of sense if you're thinking about the context of the war at that moment. The, the Southern position uh, is, is in the West is in complete disarray. Rosecrans is pushing on uh, Chattanooga. Uh, where is the South going to find reinforcements to send uh, to Robert E. Lee? But Meade is an army commander and can only see what's right in front of him. Uh, and uh, so the plan to go in the Loudoun Valley was good. Uh, he didn't really think it would amount to much because he figured Lee would retreat faster than he could advance. Uh, and when he finds out that Lee's not doing that, uh, he doesn't sort of seize opportunity. He's puzzled by it. And so he comes to a stop for 36 hours until he can figure out what's actually going on. Uh, and that's going to give Lee the initiative and Lee's going to make the most of it. So if Meade makes a mistake here, that's the mistake he makes. Um, is it an understandable mistake? You know, your intelligence is what your intelligence is, right? And here's the thing that everybody forgets. The Army of the Potomac was wrecked at Gettysburg just like the Army of Northern Virginia was wrecked at Gettysburg. Uh, he's lost two corps commanders. He's lost uh, three, three actually, if you count Hancock uh, being wounded. Uh, he's lost a fistful of division and brigade commanders. He's lost 300 officers. Uh, and, uh, and although he's been sent reinforcements, a lot of those reinforcements are emergency militia uh, or green troops who've never seen combat and me considers them to be all but worthless. Uh, if you pit them against the veterans of the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, so not wanting to risk uh, a pitched battle unless he believed that he could fight it in circumstances that were wholly in his favor is careful. Um, some people might argue overcautious. Uh, I, I prefer careful. Uh, it's, it's in some sense, you know, you would... You would rather not lose than risk winning uh, because the, the, the odds could go either way. Uh, one thing's for sure, the Army of the Potomac uh, still respects the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, and when the Federals saw that the Confederates had made an orderly retreat across the Potomac, uh, the, the idea that maybe the, the A and B is demoralized dissipates completely. It's like we still have our old enemy in front of us, and that enemy's dangerous. Uh, and and Meade treats that enemy with the respect uh, that it's due. Uh, the strategy of wearing down the South uh, is something that the, the Federals are not going to come up with until they're really almost forced to do it in 1864. Uh, everybody in 63 is still playing the game of let's fight great big decisive battles and destroy enemy armies. Uh, in Waterloo-like engagements. It's certainly what Lee's after. Uh, it's, it's what Rosecrans is after. It's even what Grant's after uh, in, in many ways. Uh, and conversely, you could argue that, you know, the South strategy is to wear the North down and exhaust it uh, in the same way. But both sides are sort of forced into that position, I think, in 1864 after the initial overland campaign losses and, and the difficulties in getting uh, to Atlanta, it's it's not per se where they start 1864 at, and it's certainly not where they are in the middle of 1863. Yeah. Okay, let me okay. pop in here. Wait, wait, let me pop in for a bit. Uh, two things. So I want to thank uh, Bob Wong for recommending, and Jeff, I'm going to put uh, I'm going to put you on the spot. You want to come back next year and, and continue on where you were? We'd love to have. Oh you. yeah, sure. I mean, this is uh, yeah. If if these two weeks here after Lee recrosses the Potomac uh, prove that the Gettysburg campaign doesn't come to an end on July 13th, uh, wait until you hear what happens in August, September, and October, and November, and early December 
1863. These, these two armies are very active. They're going to recover from Gettysburg very quickly. So by the time you get to the end of August, both the AOP and the ANB are at the same strength they were on July 1st of 1863. Uh, and so just like after every big battle before, the armies recover, the, the young men are resilient, and within a sh very short period of time, they're, they're ready to have at each other again. That's so, our coming uh, attraction Jeff, for next you, year. <laughs> yeah, Jeff, do you mind if I put your email address in chat for additional questions? Oh, uh, that's absolutely you, fine. And yeah. if, uh, if if anybody would like to get a, a signed copy of, yeah. of one of the books, I have them. Uh, and uh, so if you email me, we can make arrangements for that. Uh, and of course, you can buy them from Savas Beatty as well, uh, except for the Bristow Station book, uh, which uh, is is out of print. Uh, but I still have some copies. So <laughs> the paperback is coming. Uh, but right now, uh, I still have the hardbacks available. So lots of accolades on a, on a great speech, uh, a presentation, I should say, uh, with a lot of details and um, uh, really a lot more information about when, when Gettysburg started and when did it really end. So we look yeah. forward to uh, July and August of, of, uh, of this campaign also. So with that, Rich, do you have anything else to add? Uh, just briefly, next month again, Jennifer Murray will be re returning for our Winter of Mead series. And the way it's going with the crowds we have for um, for this year, I, I think I'd like to continue the Winter of Mead again for next year. So, yeah, um, we've we had 140 today and 128 last time, which which set our record. Uh, no, actually, we had one uh, which set our record for uh, Zoom participation. But I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. It's um, we really appreciate it. And again, it's thanks to Richie and Kowski for co-hosting us. Okay, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Good night, everyone. Good night.